Welcome to Fossils and Fiction, a podcast exploring cultural and scientific ideas about dinosaurs. I'm Travis Holland. Today my guest is Berea Sachs, an author and adjunct professor in English at Mercy College and teacher at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York. Maria is the author of Dinomania, Why We Love, Fear, and Are Utterly Enchanted by Dinosaurs, and Avian Illuminations, A Cultural History of Birds. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Now, Boria, you've authored several books examining the relationship between humans and the natural world. And uh, I've noticed a bit of a trend there in some of that work. What are your major observations about that relationship? Well, uh, part of the fascination for me is that uh, our ideas of what is human, our definitions of, of what is human are so um, far-ranging and so various. There are legal definitions and biological definitions, philosophical definitions, poetic definitions, and so on. They're all constantly changing, and they don't synchronize uh, with one another very well, sometimes hardly at all. And so if it were another concept, um, people would probably um, dismiss it as, as incoherent or meaningless or something of the sort, but we can't dismiss it that way because it's too important. It's what we are. So um, we constantly need to rethink it and revise it. Now, uh, we um, define ourselves in reference to nature. Nature um, supposedly is all the things that we think we are not. But at the same time, um, our conceptions of nature constantly change as well uh, as we um, uh, try to incorporate into our own identity of uh, features that we think are admirable or as we try to expel uh, from our own identity those that uh, we think are uh, harmful. And so um, we have this perpetual dialectic uh, between um humankind and nature. And uh, by looking at all of the twists and turns, um, we um, learn a lot more about both. Uh, I don't think that we will ever come up with a definition of humankind that is even remotely perfect or complete, but yet at the same time, uh, even though these grand philosophical questions may be ultimately unanswerable, uh, thinking about them uh, brings perspective and wisdom. I think that's really interesting. I love the little connections you get in life sometimes, and they might be called coincidences or, uh, you know, they might be some sort of cosmic 
fate, but I was listening yesterday to episode 117 of the Weird Studies podcast by Phil Ford and J.F. Martell. And that episode, they were talking about play and they described play as pre-cultural. And at one point during the during the episode, they were... Uh, well, the background is that they were discussing how animals play just as much as humans do, and that's why it's pre-cultural. It exists before any other form of our culture. And then they described uh, within play theory and game theory how... Uh, not game theory in the economic sense, of course, <laughs> game theory in the humanities sense, theories about games, uh, how you will find that um, the, the essence of play is actually a way of accessing nature, the, the relationship between um, the intellectual and the physical pursuits of play are, in fact, something that we take from nature and we call the human, but in fact it is entirely part of the natural order. And I think um, I just, I, I, you know, I don't know where I'm kind of going with that, but I find that link between what you were just saying about the separating ourselves and trying to understand where we fit in the natural order um, to be really linked in with the concept that I was just thinking about deeply yesterday uh, in concert with, with Phil Ford and J.F. Martell via their podcast. So... Thank you for adding to that thought. Well, thank you very much uh, as well. Uh, I think, you know, there is certainly at least a strong uh, element of play in virtually everything that we do. Um, nothing is really entirely pragmatic because um, uh there are no goals that we can take for granted, uh, you know, not even self-preservation. Um, for the most part, people do want to preserve themselves, but not always. And um, uh, so uh, however puritanical people may uh, seem to be there's an element of play that can't be banished. Thank you. Um, I know that was a little digression from our planned discussion, <laughs> but I just, as I say, I love those little connections you see sometimes. And when you do humanities thinking, I guess, even approaching scientific topics, you come up with these connections that others might miss sometimes. So, um, now, the discussion that we were going to have mostly today is about your lovely book, which I have here, Dinomania. Uh, and of course, I've introduced that for the audience a little bit. The dedication of Dinomania reads, to the little boy I used to be in the hope that he may yet grow up to be a dinosaur. Could you tell me about that? Well, uh, I was. Like so many kids, I was fascinated uh, by dinosaurs, and um, I most especially remember visiting the uh, Field Museum, where in the main lobby they had uh, a, a um, skeleton of a brontosaurus, and then right next to it was a single bone uh, that you would touch. Um, now, I was sort of an alienated kid, and I think the dinosaurs um, spoke to my alienation. Um, the brontosaurus especially, you know, it was all by itself. Uh, there was no partner in combat. Um, uh, it was just there. And, um, well, there was something that in that that really appealed to me. Now, um, um, I think... A large part of the reason why 
dinosaurs appeal to children especially and to others as well is the combination of great power and great vulnerability. It's basically um, the formula by which we as human beings define ourselves. We think we're dominant and at the same time, endlessly vulnerable. You know, we um, were constantly obsessed with threats and natural and otherwise with extinction and so on. Uh, For children, it's especially acute because their smallness contrasts with the vast size of the dinosaurs and their lack of power um, contrasts with the enormous uh, power that the dinosaurs seem to have had, but at the same time, um, you can never forget that vulnerability because as um, Shep White put it, speaking to Stephen uh, Jay Gould, they're fierce, powerful, and extinct. Um, and again, um, it's something that resonates for us as human beings, but uh, most especially for children. I think that's really interesting and it's a message that, yeah, you're right, it, it resonates very much for humanity and especially when we look at those those existential threats, you know. Uh, I think there's a line in, in Jurassic Park, <laughs> in fact, where Ian Malcolm, uh, the book, not, not the film, but Ian Malcolm talks about the planet will be fine um, after we're gone, but obviously we won't be, so... And, and he's referring to climate change, you know, saying the planet will go on, but we won't. Um, mm-hmm. and Absolutely. Um, and, you know, um, I suppose you could say, well, why do we care so much about um, whether humankind survives? I, it might be even blasphemous to ask the question, but um, it's one of these questions that... Uh, you can't help asking occasionally. It'll flip through your mind. Um, And, you know, in the end, it's it's unanswerable. You know, whatever the reason, we care. I like that. Uh, I think that's really nice. We we care, right? We generate meaning out of out of the world around us and out of uh, these beasts of of long extinct, extinct creatures. Uh, like the Brontosaurus at, at the Field Museum. Paleontologists uh, and their relationship to dinosaur media in particular strikes me as quite interesting. Obviously, a lot of paleontologists were inspired by films or books or whatever it may have been. Um, and perhaps others were inspired by their visits to museums. Um, but... I think sometimes they may struggle to reconcile how the public sees dinosaurs, which probably is overly influenced by films. Uh, And of course, you know, Jurassic World Dominion comes out this year and and, and the Jurassic World series has been uh, a huge part of that over the last 30 years. Uh, The sort of big, fierce dinosaurs that are insatiable in hunger, um, for example, how do you think paleontologists should reconcile that public perception with what they're trying to do in their own work? Well, um, I think all of us, whether we're paleontologists or not, when we hear about dinosaurs, we form pictures of them in our minds Uh, And perhaps we uh, construct them 
digitally or we draw them on paper. Um, inevitably, whether we're paleontologists or not, uh, that involves a great deal of conjecture. Um, you know, I mean, uh, even the most perfect skeleton can only tell you so much about what the animal looked like. Uh, even uh, when some of the skin has been fossilized, Again, it, it can only tell you so much. Now, um, paleontologists, I think, are uh, part of a process by which society um, socially constructs our images of dinosaurs. They don't do it alone. They're helped by teachers and journalists and web designers and museum goers and uh, all sorts of amateurs. Uh, they're helped by artists and so on. Um, they are not really the high priests of the, this process. They uh, have a terribly important role, but it's one role among many. Uh, inevitably, uh, just like everybody else, they're going to see cartoons of dinosaurs. They're going to see uh, movies that feature dinosaurs and all sorts of pictures. And inevitably, they're going to be influenced by these both consciously and unconsciously. And um, uh, I think that um, they should recognize their role as much as possible and embrace it. But if they think they can control the process, um, then uh, that's an illusion. You know, in, in a sense, you could say uh, they're team leaders and the team embraces people in uh, several vocations and with several different social roles. I think that's that's a really interesting take. It's a it's um it's not a science which is accessed only via science in a sense. It's not a science whose knowledge only comes from the scientists. Absolutely. I mean, um, uh, if if it were just uh, you know a matter of um, keeping quiet until you had all the evidence, then um, uh, there would just be a, a few esoteric documents. Uh, but um, dinosaurs have a very special role because they mediate between the scientists and the larger public. And, you know, you can see this in museums, in any museum, um, in any natural history museum of any size. Uh, the first thing that you see when you enter is probably going to be something about dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs um, uh, attract children and their parents and everybody else to the larger uh, endeavor of natural history, um, they have a very central and irreplaceable role there. And, you know, even despite uh, perhaps the, the presence of those sort of movies and things as a central, you know, notion. 
you're talking about what museums also do. For example, this is just an excuse so I can segue into playing this, which comes from a natural history museum. And, you know, everybody recognises this kind of sound. This is a large dinosaur uh, claimed to be a Diplodocus, but we, we have no real way of knowing whether that's what a Diplodocus sounds like as it walks through um, the landscape, for example. Well, uh, you know, we, we, um, we can only guess, and perhaps we can't help it, but, you know, just consider how it is with, animals uh, in general. I mean, uh, people, you know, they think of an eagle, a great big bird. Uh, They expect that its call is going to be very loud and kind of frightening, but it's just this little high-pitched kind of mew, sort of, and, um, you know, our imagination of the sound is uh, really a um, consequence of uh, our visual imagination. We sort of expect that um, a great big animal will have a very deep, loud voice and a kind of rumbling uh, sound and uh, maybe sort of gravelly, um, but... There's no special reason for that. Who knows? You're almost begging me to hit more of these buttons here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you you were talking about an eagle, so here's an Archaeopteryx. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like it. It's (laughs) a little bit like, um, oh, I'm not sure there's a, a little bit of a red-tailed hawk in there, I think. Uh, you know, it's 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 fun. You know, uh, it's it's fun to imagine these things. I I wouldn't take it terribly seriously. <laughs> uh, well, we we already talked about play, and of course, you've got to have a bit of fun with these things. So now, Bria, you ascribe lots of ancient myths and legends to the discovery of dinosaur bones and various other fossils. Um, to what extent then, and we've already perhaps touched on some of this, but to what extent do you think our culture still mythologizes dinosaurs? Oh, very, very much. I think it mythologizes them uh, as much as it ever did right now. Um, you know, it's, um, again, with all of these environmental threats and uh, the prospect of nuclear war and so on, we're very preoccupied, among other things, with uh, our own extinction and uh, the fact that um, the dinosaurs are extinct adds not only some more intellectual fascination, but I would say a sort of glamour to them as well. I think, um, you know, discoveries are, are just being made about dinosaurs uh, faster than they ever have been before. I don't think even the paleontologists can keep up with all of them. And um, uh, mm. it's um, in lots of ways, I think that the um, mythology of dinosaurs is now re-combining with the older mythology of dragons. You know, they uh, there was a lot of affinity between the two from the beginning. Uh, dragons, like dinosaurs, were associated with an earlier time in... Uh, uh, 
uh, an earlier age, and uh, they were also believed to live underneath the ground very often. Um, so there were a lot of affinities, and uh, dinosaurs were rec- uh, discovered just as people ceased to believe in dragons or demons or angels. And so there wasn't any continuity now then, or there wasn't much. But now uh, you see um, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and other dinosaurs appearing in all sorts of uh uh, digital games and uh, um, in uh, all sorts of uh, contexts that uh, are not very scientific and don't pretend mm. to be. Uh, in a sense, I think that um, the old mythology is perhaps... Uh, once again, merging with the new one. And related to that, there's a particular um, arrangement of archetypes which you talk very much about in Dynomania, or in the early part anyway. And you refer to Megalosaurus and Iguanodon, which were two of the earliest dinosaurs that were described and how they were established as a kind of archetypal pair, uh, which you label Mr. Big and Mr. Fierce. How do you think the idea of an archetypal pair of a sort of fierce carnivore and a large herbivore have shaped our perception of dinosaurs into that mythology? Well, those were um, the first two dinosaurs that were discovered. And... um, I think it ties in with our long-standing ambivalence about predation. Now you can see this going back to the Bible. Uh, you know, the uh, agriculturalists uh, like predators because the herbivores would eat their crops and the predators would keep them away. Uh, On the other hand, for herders, particularly sheep herders, and um, the um, predators were a continuous threat. Sort of going a little bit further in time, um, you find that the aristocrats who were landowners and therefore very directly dependent on crops, uh, tended to identify with predators. They would pick, uh, generally speaking, animals like the wolf or the lion as uh, their heraldic symbols, whereas um, others that were more democratically inclined would view these animals as savage and uncivilized and had a strong preference for um, herbivores, particularly domesticated ones. Um, When the iguanodon was discovered, I think there was a lot of ambivalence. On the one hand, people like to identify with this enormous, ferocious predator. At the same time, they feel threatened by it and they feel kind of uneasy about it. Uh, When um, dinosaurs were first discovered in the early 19th century, you know, people were really scared of them. And when there were exhibits of uh, models of dinosaurs, people were scared of the exhibits. And so they matched the giant predator with a 
equally powerful herbivore that uh, was essentially their protector and that uh, paradoxically helped them to admire the predator from a certain psychic distance um, and uh, the two are constantly paired in uh, exhibitions of dinosaurs um, in Britain it was uh, the, the iguanodon um, uh, in America, it would be uh, the Tyrannosaurus and the Triceratops, but um, the uh, again the herbivore uh, prevented the predator from becoming too frightening and too charismatic. The predator um, prevented the herbivore from being a little bit too placid and too contented. So um, uh, exhibitions of dinosaurs always try to balance the two. The... Uh, there's been some competing ideas about um, particularly herbivores uh, as being, um, you know, either lumbering and slow or stupid uh, compared to sort of active and parenting um, as well over time. Now, in the book, you talk about those sort of exhibits and other dinosaur media that always had the two paired off together. Um, but often you said that they were hinting at violence, that they often didn't show it in detail. You know, there was no blood <laughs> in a sense. Right, exactly. <clears throat> they're, they're paused for con combat. They're not actually engaged in combat. That might have changed recently, I think, um, and I think you even suggest that that changed with perhaps with Jurassic Park. Uh, so what do you make of that series of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, and its role in how we see dinosaurs now? Well, I don't think the change was by any means due to Jurassic Park. Uh, it's a broader change in society. Um, you know, I remember as a kid uh, watching the nature shows with uh, Marvin Perkins, and they were always very idyllic, and they would never show predation, and uh, they would never show sex. And now, in nature specials, it's just the opposite. Um, what they used to censor out has become uh, prime footage. You know, they they emphasize predation and and sex. Yeah, and well, we can think um, of the... sometimes you get the the impression that. Uh, from these shows as if nature were nothing else but but just fighting and mating and that's about it. Um, so we, we go to extremes about this. Uh, as far as Jurassic Park, um, I don't think it was that much of a trendsetter. Uh, you know, it's, it's built on many other specials about dinosaurs before that 1 million BC and 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 uh, Fantasia and so on and um, in a way it was a pretty old-fashioned and pretty conventional horror movie um, it's um, had the latest in special effects um, you know, it was uh, state of the art, but apart from that, I, I don't think it was very innovative, and I think part of its appeal probably was nostalgia, uh, you know, apart from all of the 
spectacular effects. It was, uh, it kind of had the ambience of a 50s horror movie. Mm. I think that's really on brand for Steven Spielberg. You know, he, uh, he, he very much is a filmmaker who attempts to recreate his own childhood experiences, in a sense. The things that he was awed by at the cinema, he wants the next generation to be awed by as well, so... I think so, and um, I think um, in general he's not a that much of an innovator, and I, I don't say this, um, you know, as a, a criticism, uh, but I think um, most of his work is pretty heavy on nostalgia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's a lot we could say about, uh, you know, keeping the sex off, off screen as well, I guess, because it, it, of course, Jurassic Park, even, even though it was a, you describe it as a horror movie or an action adventure, but, it, but it was also a family movie in many ways, you know, it was pitched as a, a blockbuster. And so, um, although it hinged on the nature of dinosaurs breeding when they shouldn't be on the idea mm-hmm. of that, uh, it was all very sterile. You know, we, we, we found that out via eggs only. Uh, there was, uh, otherwise dinosaurs were created in the lab. There was often debate about whether uh, Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler were, were even actually together, <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. it was only kind of hinted at, I guess. And, and the only way it was really hinted at was when uh, Malcolm became, a, a, you know, interested in Dr. Sattler. Anyway, I, I'm going to read about Jurassic Park too much, so I won't, I won't keep you for that. Um, you talked briefly about paleontologists sometimes not even being able to keep up with the sort of speed of their own, their own field. Um, and, and whether or not paleontologists can keep up, I think the public sometimes struggles to keep up. And so we had the debate really recently about whether there are actually, in fact, multiple Tyrannosaurus species. So Tyrannosaurus rex being split up into three different species, being Tyrannosaurus rex, Tyrannosaurus imperator, and Tyrannosaurus regina, or king, queen, and emperor. Um, uh, There was another paper last week which caused a bit of a stir about uh, Spinosaurus, you know, describing Spinosaurus actually as being aquatic or mostly aquatic, more akin to a crocodile, uh, or, or a penguin, I think, was the other comparison they made rather than, uh, rather than something that lived primarily on land. Do you keep up with those debates or you've moved on? Well, I, um, I don't follow. I follow them a little. I follow them enough to, uh, to have heard about them, but I never really try to follow them closely. I find they're interesting uh, but uh, I think they're pretty much unresolvable. Um, the the one about whether Tyrannosaurus rex is uh, one species or several, for example, um, it, it's what's a different species is uh, pretty subjective, even with animals that are still around. And some scientists uh, reject the concept of species altogether. Um, Now, with uh, uh, living animals, um, there's at least uh, a rough criteria. Uh, If animals uh, interbreed, then they're considered to be of the same species. If they don't, probably not. But again, this is just a rough criteria, and uh, it's usually uh, just one of many. But when it comes to Tyrannosaurus rex, well, you know, uh, all you can do is guess wildly as to whether these various um uh, kinds could interbreed or not. Uh, and, um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, 
but uh, ultimately, I suspect, uh, kind of futile. Um, but one thing that's very intriguing about all of these di- uh, uh, debates about dinosaurs is how they reflect our changing understanding of what it means to be human. We have the same debate uh, with respect to human beings. Were the uh, uh, Neanderthals uh, the same species as the Cro-Magnet man? Um, did, was there just one species of human being or were there several? Um, and uh, I think it's at least possible that um, there is a connection here that maybe um, it's not an accident that this was raised uh, with reference to Tyrannosaurus not too long after it was raised in reference to humankind. That's really interesting, and because we, I guess we assume, or based on the research, but we we assume that uh, Homo sapiens outcompeted the other human species in a sense. Well, um, again, um, you know, there's uh, the old question of. Um, uh, whether we uh, interbred with them or whether we uh, uh, drove them to extinction or what. And um, uh, it's it's one of these questions that's uh, uh, paralleled in the questions that we ask about dinosaurs. Um, and of course, it links back to you know how we see ourselves as human and how we do that in the the myths, I guess, that we've created about about dinosaurs. No, well, we um, uh, at least in the United States, uh, we tend to identify humanity very much with um, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, I think that's not nearly as much the case in Britain and uh, um, other parts of the world. But um, it may have something to do with this same combination of supposed dominance and vulnerability. We see ourselves, again, as terribly powerful and as, at the same time, utterly vulnerable. And uh, we see these, this combination reflected in Tyrannosaurus rex, especially, uh, perhaps especially in the United States, which, um, uh, where we have t- felt both pride and shame at being... Um, the most powerful nation in the world. And um, in a way, uh, the world of dinosaurs is kind of like a mirror. You know, we look into it. They look back at us, um, Tyrannosaurus especially. Uh, Plus, uh, it's a little easier to identify with Tyrannosaurus because it's bipedal and, you know, it uh, has something um, approaching a, the sort of uh, human morphology. And certainly the dominance, you know, we see ourselves as the top of the food chain and I think we probably see Rex as in that vein as well. Right. And, you know, in, in both cases, uh, it's very subjective. I mean, uh, uh, we don't have any criterion of dominance. Uh, you know, other animals like snails um, uh, have much more members than we do. And 
are much more diverse than we are. Um, uh, quite a few animals are likely to uh, survive after we're gone. Um, and the same can be true of dinosaurs as well. Somehow or other, we've decided that they're dominant, but um, uh, there's there's just no objective measure of that. Uh, you know, um, uh, we've... Um, We've sensed an affinity. We we uh, feel more affinity that for them than we do for our own uh, evolutionary ancestors, um, and we project a lot of our collective human self image onto them. But um, in the end, it's. It's it's all pretty subjective, I think. That's probably a good note to draw it to a close, really. So the, the last question I want to ask is, what's your favourite dinosaur? Uh, I like the Brontosaurus. <laughs> I liked it as a kid, and I still do. Um, again, uh, for kids, but I think for me particularly, Dinosaurs seem to address a feeling of alienation. And uh, the Brontosaurus, at least as it's presented, seems to uh, stand a little apart, not only from our world of human beings, but even from the world of dinosaurs. Others like Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops at least have a sort of companion in battle, um, but Dura Brontosaurus uh, is usually alone and has something very meditative and very iconic about it thank you so much for joining me for this interview is there anything you'd like to plug do you have any other books coming out soon well uh just out there's my book avian illuminations um and cultural oh, history of dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah right right it's uh uh you could you could see it as a sequel to the book on dinosaurs and um, uh, it's about human-bird relationships uh, in all their facets from uh, Neolithic times until today. And right now I'm um, in the middle of writing a cultural history of forests. The, um, oh, all the various ways that people have thought of forests, the... Uh, uh, the uh, classical forest, the Rococo forest, the Gothic forest, the primeval forest, the jungle, the swamp, um, and how um, these have evolved and what they uh, tell us not only about flora and fauna, but also about human beings. Fantastic. Maria, thank you so much again. Um, I look forward to talking with you another time, I'm sure. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, Travis. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you to Borea Sachs for joining me for that conversation. You can find Borea's books, Dynamania, Why We Love Fear and Utterly Enchanted by Dinosaurs, and Avian Illuminations, A Cultural History of Birds, at all major booksellers. Look out for his forthcoming work on forests. Thank you for listening to the Fossils and Fiction podcast, produced by me, Travis Holland, with the support of Charles Sturt University. 
The podcast theme music is Sonora by Quincas Morea via the YouTube audio library. Find more content on our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Show notes are available on the website fossilsfiction.co. You can subscribe to the podcast on all major podcasting platforms. 